In Jeremiah 2, verse 27, the, the ancient prophet describes what some pagans would say. Uh, paganism was a common practice in that part of the world and in that time. And it's still, you know, common practice in certain parts of the world. And uh, some pagans would say to a carved piece of wood, you are my father. And they would say to a stone, again, a stone that they would carve out and make, a, make into idol, make into statue, you gave birth to me. Now, why would they do something like this? Well, Jeremiah tells us in that verse, it's because they turned their back on God, right? And in this way, ancient paganism and modern atheism are similar. Now, an atheist today will not carve an idol out of wood or stone and then say something to it like, you created me. However, atheists will claim that life inexplicably millions of years ago just started all on its own, right? Well, started from what? Well, started from that primordial soup, came from the water and the rocks and all the, you know, just natural substances in the world. And uh, again, that's one of the claims they will make that life came from non-living things. Again, just like again, the ancient pagans would say to a tree or to a piece of wood, you're my father, you gave birth to me. By rejecting God, by rejecting the true and living God, people make themselves God, at least in their own way of thinking. The Bible teaches us that we ought to give people, we ought to be ready and able to give people reasonable answers for why we have hope in Jesus Christ. And uh, the, the main point of this morning's sermon is, is really a simple one. Uh, one answer you can give to anyone, whether they're an atheist or they have uh, some doubts about God, uh, is the fact that the Bible teaches we were created, that God is our father, um, not this world. And, and most importantly, that is what the Bible teaches, teaches but we could add to that as, as a secondary point. That's what science teaches as well. Now, science may not put it in the, the words of God created us, but it is a scientific principle. It's actually a scientific law that all life comes from existing life. Uh, life does not just happen randomly on its own. And it's, uh, it's sad that how, how many people have been persuaded to believe in that lie. Um, so this morning, I'd like to begin by um, briefly talking about naturalism. Uh, or materialism. Uh, naturalism is the worldview of the atheist. And again, there, there, there might be a, a lot of people in our country who would not specifically claim they're atheists, uh, but there's people who do believe in atheistic ideas. Even people who claim to be Christians believe in ideas that are part and parcel with atheism and that have nothing to do with the Bible, have nothing to do with the teachings of Christ. And uh, we ought to be aware of that, that kind of thing. So again, naturalism is the worldview of the atheist. It's the worldview which believes nature, hence the, the name naturalism, that nature or matter, materialism, that's all there is. Uh, the atheists claim that there is no God, there is no spirit, there is no kind of supernatural reality, there is only nature, there's only matter, uh, the physical. And if this claim is true, that there's only nature, there's only the physical, then one must believe the genesis of life on earth is a product of the earth itself. That life exists because of nature and the, the natural world. Um, again, the Encyclopedia Britannica, I think, again, a good classic uh, standard resource that, that people uh, will use. Um, it says this about again, atheism and uh, again, what I'd say is kind of the classical, one of the classical ideas uh, regarding atheists. The encyclopedia says, quote, the atheist asserts that life created itself, a belief known as biopoiesis. The Encyclopedia Britannica defines biopoiesis, uh, also called spontaneous generation, abiogenesis, and autogenesis as a process by which living organisms are thought to develop from non-living matter and the basis of a theory on the origin of life on earth." End quote. So you have all these kind of difficult words to say. Say biopoiesis five times fast, right? Um, spontaneous generation, autogenesis. 
These are all just, again, kind of scientific or scholarly words to say life started on its own with no rhyme or reason, just by chance. Uh, atheists who believe life came into existence on its own are, again, not only contradicting the Bible, which as believers in God, we should care about the most, but they're also contradicting a scientific law. And this isn't just a, a theory, but this is actually a law that's been well established in, in science. And if you've never heard of it, I encourage you to look it up and read about it uh, later today in your free time. It's called the law of biogenesis. And the law of biogenesis simply states that every living thing comes from pre-existing life. So whether it is uh, plant life or animal life or human life, everything that is living in this world comes from something else that is living. Again, that's been tested. That's been proven. Uh, we can see that hundreds of times a day, right? Babies come from their parents, right? And your parents came from their parents and their parents came from their parents and so on and so on and so on. Every life that exists today comes from pre-existing life. But we have to ask ourselves, if we could go back in time, where did that first living being come from? However you want to describe it, whether human or whatever, where did that first living being come from? Well, again, it's a scientific principle. All living things come from something else that is alive. Um, and yet atheists want to reject that. They want to say, if we could go back far enough in time, then life just started on its own. Again, inexplicably, uh, inexplicably, without any reason, just chaotic. And again, that contradicts scripture. That contradicts scientific uh, laws. So again, they will claim life started on its own from non-living things. They are repeating what ancient pagans said in the time of Jeremiah. Again, they're saying, in essence, to a tree, you're my father. And a stone, you gave birth to me. And why would someone say something as ridiculous as this? Right? As a human being looking at uh, a piece of wood, right? a piece of stone. I came from you. Right? Well, again, Jeremiah tells us they've turned their back on me. This is the Lord God speaking through Jeremiah. They've they turned their back on God. And so when someone truly turns their back on God and turns their back on the truth, it's inevitable that they're going to be speaking things that are just foolishness, absurdities. And uh, again, we should call that out and not accept it. It's foolishness to believe that human life came from the water and the mud and trees and dirt. Um, so, again, there are people. Uh, in the past who have denied the true and living God and their people uh, today uh, who, again, are following in their steps, who, who deny God. And uh, if you have a Bible, I encourage you to turn with me to the book of, of Romans. And uh, the Apostle Paul, when he wrote to Christians at Rome, he, he talked about why some uh, would deny God, even those who are intelligent enough uh, to believe in God and understand that he uh, exists. And uh, in the beginning of this, this book, you can turn with me to Romans 1 if you'd like to follow along. Romans chapter 1. Um, Paul describes why there are people who would choose to believe in things which are irrational instead of trusting in God and trusting in well-established facts. So Romans 1, let's start with verse 18. Romans 1 verse 18 the scriptures say, for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth and unrighteousness. Because that which may be known of God is manifest in them. For God has showed it unto them. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made. Even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Because that, when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imagination, and the, their foolish hearts were, uh, were darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. And then go down to verse 25, Romans 1 25, still speaking about those who would deny God's existence. Romans 1 25 says, who changed the truth of God into a lie and worshiped and served the creature more than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. 
So, you know, Paul says some significant things here uh, when he wrote to the church at, at Rome. Now, if we back up to verse 18, the uh, King James uh, phrases it as those who hold the truth in unrighteousness. I, I believe some other translations will read a little differently there. And the word hold here means to hold down or to suppress. Again, there's, there's certain facts a person must deny and su suppress to believe God does not exist. And when you look at verses 19 and following, Paul mentions that he doesn't mention anything specifically, but he mentions that the, the fact that God exists or the belief that God exists, it's manifest by the created world. Um, he says there in verse 20, the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made. Even his eternal power and God has, so they are without excuse. So again, one of the things that have been made that exist in this world, again, is us, human beings. And I think in a basic, you know, kind of existential question is, why am I here? Where did I come from? And again, the atheistic kind of thinking is, well, we just came from the earth. We just, life just started all on its own. We came from nature. Again, that's irrational. It's unbiblical and it's unscientific. And yet a lot of people have believed in that lie. Again, verse 25 really emphasizes they, they've changed the truth of God into lies. Some people would rather believe lies than trust in, uh, in the truth. Now, I'm not going to read it for time's sake, but if you want to continue in your free time uh, reading in Romans, if you look at verses 20 and following... Uh, describe some lifestyles, people call it, that be, have become somewhat popular uh, nowadays and some other immoral uh, activities. And we're here we're told why people would rather believe in lies than put their trust in God. In short, they don't want to submit to God's will for whatever reason. Uh, some people will claim if they want to entertain the idea that God exists, they'll claim that God is not fair, uh, that God is cruel. That God is unloving, that God is judgmental. And I've heard all kinds of, again, reasons people will say, I don't believe in God for X, Y, and Z. Uh, and therefore, I believe in this, this other thing. And so people will submit to all kinds of ideas or philosophies or religions and not submit to, again, God and the truth he's revealed in the Bible. Now, if you and I are genuine believers in God, then we must reject this. And sadly, there are even people in the religious world who would call themselves Christians who are religious, so to speak. But again, they're not willing to submit to God's will. They're not willing to follow the plain teachings that we find in Scripture. Um, one passage that would describe this is Colossians 2.23. And this is the uh, New King James. Here it says, these things indeed have an appearance of wisdom in self-imposed religion. False humility and neglect of the body, but of our no value against the indulgence of the flesh. Again, that's Colossians 2 verse 23. So here the Bible is describing religious people, right? But their religion does not come from trusting in God and trusting in his word. Again, the, the, the text here says their religion comes from a self-imposed uh, kind of worship, a self-imposed worship. Uh, religion. So this is describing people who've made up their own kind of faith and have decided to follow the, the rules, so to speak, of in theology, religion, faith, philosophy, however you want to put it. They just want to follow their own rules and they're not submitting to God and his, his will for their life. So again, let's reject this wherever it comes from, whether it comes from a secular, unbelieving world, people who want to deny God. Or people who want to claim to be religious but still are not following what the scriptures say. And let's be diligent in trusting in God and putting our faith in him. Um, let's look at one more passage this morning. Turn with me to the book of Isaiah. I'd like us to, I'd like us to read from uh, Isaiah chapter 44. Atheists who reject the true and living God. Again, I believe do so for, for some of the same reasons ancient pagans did. They turn their back on God because if God does not exist, at least again, according to their way of thinking, if God does not exist, then what is the highest authority? 
What do I have to submit to if there's, there's no higher power out there? Well, ultimately, just me. You know, I'm the highest authority. You, you, and yourself, you know, humanity. And uh, I do believe, again, when you look at, uh, if you've ever studied, you know, pagans, especially how it's described in Scripture, uh, there were people who believed in, you know, various gods. But there's no doubt in my mind, uh, some people believed in paganism because paganism has that same appeal that really human beings are the highest authority and not not God Almighty. Uh, read with me Isaiah 44. Let's start with verse 14. Isaiah chapter 44, verse 14. Uh, actually, let's back up to verse 13. Isaiah 44, verse 13. The carpenter stretcheth out his rule. He marketh it out with a line. He fitteth it with planes. And he marketh it out with a compass and maketh it after the figure of a man, according to the beauty of a man, that it may remain in his house. He heweth him down cedars and taketh the cypress and the oak, which he strengtheneth for himself among the trees of the forest. He planteth an ash and the rain doth nourish it. Then it shall be for a man to burn, for he'll take thereof and warm himself. Yea, he kindleth it and bakes bread. Yea, he maketh a god and worshipeth it. He maketh it a graven image and falleth down thereto. He burneth part thereof in the fire. With part thereof he eateth flesh, he roasteth roast, and is satisfied. Yea, he warmeth himself and saith, Aha, I am warm. I've seen the fire. And the residue thereof he maketh a god. Even his graven image, he falleth down unto it and worshipeth it. And prayeth unto it, and saith, Deliver me, for thou art my God. They have not known nor understood, for he hath shut their eyes that they cannot see, and their hearts that they cannot understand. And none considereth in his heart, neither is there knowledge nor understanding to say, I have burnt part of it in the fire, yea, also I have baked bread upon the coals thereof. I have roasted flesh and eaten it. And yet shall I make the residue thereof an abomination? Shall I fall down to the stock of a tree? So I, the prophet Isaiah here is trying to point out to those who would listen to him and those who would read his words or hear his words spoken. How silly it is that someone would take a tree or stone or something like that and, and then carve it into an idol and then say, well, this this is my God and pray to that thing and worship that and say that this is where I come from. This this idol Made me. Right? Someone will, you know, ancient times, again, even today, people make idols and worship idols. They take a tree, you know, cut it down, chop it up, you know, make a nice fire to warm themselves, cook their food, you know, so they could provide for themselves, give themselves sustenance. And then from that same tree, they would carve a god, carve their idol. Well, let me ask you this. When a person makes a statue and worships it as God, again, this is. Probably not relevant for us today, but, you know, someone's going to make a statue and, and that's their God. And it's the individual that moves that statue around. You know, if we want to, you know, change its location, it's the individual who dresses that statue. It's the individual who would even put food in front of that statue to feed the God or as an offering to that God. Well, who is the real God in that situation? Well, it's the person, isn't it? Because I, I dictate everything this idol does. Again, it's a way of making the human being the number one authority. And again, I believe that is what atheism is in a nutshell. It's an, it's an attempt to think about the world in a way that makes the, the human being the number one or the ultimate uh, authority. Uh, it is a kind of self-worship, a self-aggrandizing. In the 1970s, Brother Thomas Warren debated an atheist named Anthony Flew, and uh, I've shared this diagram a few times, and uh, I think it's worth uh, a repeated share. And uh, these two men debated the existence of God, and if you've never listened to this debate, I'd encourage you to do so. If you have internet access, you can find it for free on YouTube. If you just type in Warren Flew Debate. Right. Warren is W-A-R-R-E-N and then flu, just like a, a bird flu. Right. Warren flu debate. And uh, it, is, it is a long debate. It took place over multiple days. I would encourage you to just listen to their opening 
statements in the first part. That's, that alone is well worth it. Uh, it is the best debate I've ever heard on the topic of God's existence. And uh, Thomas Warren was a brother in Christ, a member of the Church of Christ. And uh, he showed how irrational the claims of atheism are. And in his opening statement, he provided an interesting diagram. And I've reproduced it up on the screen for you to uh, consider. And uh, he called this, uh, this diagram Flu's Prison. And this diagram is, is meant to represent a series of rooms. So this is a, a top-down view of several rooms. Uh, and there's a room in the center... And outside of it are several other rooms. And Thomas Warren asks us to imagine that each of these rooms are made of steel and concrete, having no windows, no doors, and no openings whatsoever. And for a person to logically be an atheist, that person must start in the center room and then somehow make his way through all the successive ones. And so again, to logically be an atheist, one must demonstrate that matter is eternal. And uh, if you actually do a little bit of research about 50 years ago, 60 years ago, that was the popular view in the scientific community that the universe was eternal, uh, that our solar system and everything was just uh, had always been that way and would never change. And that has actually gone by the wayside. Uh, scientists now believe what's commonly called the Big Bang and the universe having a beginning, uh, matter having a beginning. Uh, that's rather a recent development, believe it or not. But um, atheists and those in the scientific community can about 50 years ago or so would say matter is eternal. The universe is eternal as it is. Um, number two there, that life originated from dead matter. And this is something atheists will claim. Um, abiogenesis, right? That, again, life came from non-living things, rocks and dirt and water uh, and so on. That's the first you know, single-celled organism just started on its own and then slowly, slowly evolved into everything we see today. Uh, next, consciousness arose from the non-conscious. Intelligence arose from the non-intelligent. And then lastly, a human being came from a non-human creature. The atheist places himself in this prison of absurdities. And, and again, we should know not only, and that my focus this morning is on that second one, life coming... Uh, from, from dead matter, just life coming to existence all on its own, we should know not only does this contradict the Word of God, most importantly, it contradicts the Word of God, but again, it contradicts science, what, what atheists claim to believe in. And it's a scientific law that life comes from life. I mean, that's never been refuted. And, and yet we, in our society, will tolerate and listen to people, oh, life millions of years ago just started from this primordial soup. And that's where we all come from. It's a bunch of hogwash. And the Bible opposes these assertions. So, again, why would someone believe this? Well, if God does not exist, then I am God. I am in control. I get to do whatever I want. And it doesn't matter what any make-believe person says out there, what anyone else says. You know, I'm the master of my own fate. But you and I are not God. You and I are not in control. I mean, don't you ever struggle just with self-control? You know, it's hard enough just to control oneself, let alone think we can control others or control the world. Again, we're not God. We're not in control. We did not create ourselves. Again, the reasonable answer is where we came from. Again, if you just want to put it in scientific terms, we came from something that's already living. In the Bible, we'll call that God. That we came from our Father. He made us. He is the eternal life which produced everything, including human beings. Let us follow the truth. Let us trust in our Maker. And again, not only did He give us physical life, but He loves us and cares enough for us to offer us eternal life, spiritual life uh, as well. And again, this culminated with Christ coming to this world. And Christ freely laying down his life to take our sins upon himself. And so if there's anyone here this morning who's not yet a follower of Jesus Christ, if you trust in the gospel message, then we encourage you to repent from dead works, to confess your faith in him, that he is Lord, that he is the Christ, the Son of God. Uh, to follow his command, to be immersed in that watery grave, to be baptized, raised to walk in newness of life. 
And then once you do that, to continue in the faith, to continue to learn and apply uh, the living word of God.